Uh, so welcome everybody to our GIVE seminar for this week. Um, this week we have a topic uh, in the clinical health theme and we're very excited for our presenter today um, and his topic. Um, so first of all, I'm going to hand over to Michaela who will run through housekeeping and then I'll introduce our wonderful speaker for today. Uh, so hi everyone, thank you for joining the Cecil Gibbs seminar series. Um, just a few housekeeping rules, uh, just a reminder that this seminar is being recorded and will be available on the uh, Psychology Events page and YouTube. Uh, upon entry of the webinar you've all been muted and we ask that you please stay muted for the duration of this seminar. Um, if you have any questions you can write them in the question box below at any time and we'll have question time at the end. Uh, we We'll also have the option to unmute you if that's what you prefer. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. And I'll hand off to our theme convener, Kristen. I am so excited to introduce our speaker today. We're really lucky. Uh, Dr. Brett Schultz, who is in the ANU Medical School as a Senior Research Fellow, uh, will be sharing his research with us today. Uh, Brett is a critical health psychologist um, who primarily undertakes research uh, using qualitative methodologies um, in a range of different areas, but with a particular focus on hearing from people with lived experience and co-producing research. I think this is a really fascinating and important topic for us, and we're really excited for you to share your research today, including some of your experience in the recent uh, ongoing COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Brett, and thank you so much for sharing your research today. Um, so I can let you get started. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kristen, and thank you everybody for attending today. It's really, uh, it's been something I've been looking forward to uh, since early in the year. I think this was originally going to be a face-to-face -face seminar back in March, uh, but of course with COVID and everything, uh, it's now uh, in this format, which in many ways is actually quite exciting. You know, the fact that we're able to have seminars, I can see people attending from, from overseas as well as from, from nearby. So wherever you've come from, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the lands that I'm currently sitting on, the Ngunnawal Ngambri people uh, and I pay my respects to their elders and uh, pay my respects to any Indigenous people who've joined us today. Uh, I guess maybe before I begin, I might just spend two minutes talking a little bit about uh, me <laughs> and how I got interested in co-production and sort of some of my experiences um, to help contextualise what I'll be talking about today. So, uh, as, as Kristen already mentioned, I'm based in the medical school here at the Australian National University, but I am a critical health psychologist. I've also had uh, roles in nursing and midwifery, in psychiatry, in public health, as well as in psychology departments. And that multidisciplinary approach to health has been something that has been um, absolutely a privilege and a real joy of, of my career. Uh, I think the opportunities to learn from people across disciplines is, is um, invaluable. The people that we often don't hear from in these multidisciplinary health teams, however, are uh, the people that I'm going to refer to as consumers. So the people who are service users of our health services or uh, the people that we traditionally did research on. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping to uh, convince everyone today why that's a problem that we used to do research on and instead need to do research with. I'm going to use the term consumers. Uh, for people outside of Australia, uh, just by way of context, that's the word that is often used within uh, our um, policy context. Uh, it was also, it's a word that was chosen by the consumer movement to refer to themselves. Um, although I have to acknowledge that that's not by consensus and uh, it's still a problematic word. But if you hear me use the word consumer, um, hopefully you understand why I'm using that word. Uh, and I guess the other thing that I just wanted to mention about how I got interested in co-production. Uh, a few years ago, I started a role as a research fellow in a nursing and midwifery research centre, which at the time was funded by the, the chief nurse here in the Australian Capital Territory. And that also, that research centre also funded a consumer researcher. So somebody who was uh, dedicated 
in a dedicated position uh, who had a lived experience of mental health. It was a mental health research centre. Uh, and it was a, a fabulous time to be able to actually be engaged in co-productive work with somebody in a dedicated role. Um, and since then, I sort of haven't looked back and I've tried to look to co-produce almost everything I do. It's probably important, therefore, to acknowledge that this uh, seminar that I'm giving today is not co-produced. You'll only have my face to look at. Uh, and in some ways, you know, that's, um, it's an opportunity lost that I didn't co-produce this seminar. Um, but I guess, regardless, I'm going to be drawing on a lot of my experiences of co-producing other projects. The last thing I wanted to say before I actually move into um, the, the seminar is, um, Oh gosh, it's actually completely gone from my mind. There was one other thing I wanted to say. Um, it might come to me later. Um, all right, so let's move into it. And I guess it makes sense to start a seminar about co-production by defining what I'm talking about when I'm talking about co-production. Whenever I uh, talk about co-production, I always go to this resource that you can see here by Kath Roper, Flick Gray and Emma Cadigan called Co-Production, Putting Principles into Practice in Mental Health Contexts. Although it's about mental health, uh, I think it goes across contexts and you can use this resource in many contexts. But essentially what I think is really important for us to remember is that we shouldn't call something co-production unless collaborative processes are occurring at every stage. So you can see in this diagram here that that includes from the planning stage of a project, so from very early on uh, before you've even begun, through to designing and evaluating and delivering the project. Um, those stages themselves might change depending on what project you're actually talking about. Um, and that's not the important thing. I guess the important thing is that collaboration needs to occur throughout the life of a project to be considered co-production. And if co-production isn't happening at all of those stages, we can't really consider it to be co-produced. Actually, I remembered what that other thing is that I was going to say, which is that a lot of the examples I'll be talking about and uh, the context I'll be discussing today uh, come from my experiences in co-producing research. Uh, but I've also co-produced curricula, uh, you know, educational materials, uh, health services and health policy. And these principles of co-production are relevant regardless of whether we're talking about a research project or an education project or a policy project or what have you. So uh, that's probably useful to keep in mind that I might keep referring to research, assuming that most people attending today are interested in co-production research, but that you could apply these same processes and principles to whatever project it is you might be looking at. So co-production needs to happen at all stages of a project. It also needs to acknowledge that there are empower imbalances. So the people that who are consumers, who have traditionally been the people that we have done research on, uh, have often been left out of discussions, have often been left out of, um, of projects, have often not had power. Uh, and I know sometimes assuming many of you are in academia, I know sometimes it can seem like we in academia don't have very much power either, as we're always grappling for resources, we're always um, hoping to get funding, we're always hoping to, to influence. Um, but I think we often forget that we do have quite a lot of power. Our knowledge is valued in society in a way that uh, other people's knowledge is often not valued in society. Uh, and we are part of an institution that's quite a powerful institution. And I think whenever we start to even think about co-producing with consumers, we do need to acknowledge those power imbalances exist. Um, and they might be different depending on the, the people that you're co-producing with. So for example, in mental health, um, there's multiple layers of power imbalances and there's issues about stigma in society more broadly. If you're talking about co-producing with uh, Indigenous people, there's, there's huge power differentials and, and issues that do need to be acknowledged um, and, and, um, and interrogated through the co-productive process. Related to that, co-production needs to recognise and celebrate expertise. As I was saying before, often uh, 
academics, our, our expertise and our knowledge is inherently valued. People look to us as leaders, as knowledge producers, uh, and often consumers' experiential expertise is not valued in the same way. It's often not um, thought of as, as valuable as our academic background. And if we want to co-produce, we need to recognise that we all have things to bring, uh, all have skills, all have um, valuable knowledges, experiences that we bring to a project. Uh, and again, if we're not valuing everyone in a meaningful way, then we can't usefully co-produce. And my last point about co-production, it's not just a fancy new method. Um, it's a, an approach to collaboration. And I think my next couple of slides might elaborate that on a little bit further. I guess what I want to also, you know, have a, have a bit of a discussion about is what co-production isn't. So co-production has become a bit of a buzzword, not even just within academia, but beyond. Uh, and this has been good as in, in terms of people are realizing why it's important to co-produce. Um, but at the same time, it means that the word has been co-opted. It's sometimes used in really problematic ways and we need to seek to avoid that. So here's just uh, a few examples of what isn't co-production. And this first example comes from a paper that I read that was talking throughout um, about being about co-producing research. Uh, I've got a few screenshots from the paper that I'll share. Uh, the first one is from the aim and you can see in the aim of this paper they were talking about co-researchers which i thought that sounds really exciting it looks like they're doing they're they're not only co-producing but they have co-researchers who are caregivers who are actually interviewing so they're doing some of the data collection in their study in the results they also talked about um co-researchers and the way that co-researchers interacted in, in the data collection phase. And I thought, this is looking great. But when I went back to the author list, you know, I didn't see any acknowledgement in the authorship of these co-researchers. There was a professor of palliative care and a reader and director of a cancer care research center. And it struck me that if I was talking about co-researchers from any other discipline, if I co-researched with um, some nursing colleagues, for example, but they weren't part of the authorship team, then it would be really problematic for me to call them co-researchers. Now, I must admit, I don't know what the story behind this study was. Maybe they had uh, discussions with these co-researchers and they didn't want to be authors. But I think it just goes back to my point earlier where academics knowledge is valued and and you know our names are on papers and we we're part of this institution of academia and knowledge production uh, but unless we are also co-authoring and and valuing the people that we're collaborating with then i don't i think it's a bit rich to call them co-researchers what i thought was even more problematic about this paper was that in the discussion section and i have a very short screen grab there from it um, in the discussion section, they were making claims uh, saying that there was a need for caution in user involvement uh, in sort of co-production. And I thought that was a little bit problematic given that um, these co-researchers weren't part of the authorship team and they were making claims and, and saying that these co-researchers were part of the team. Um, and they were making claims about saying we shouldn't involve um, consumers as part of the teams. And I just thought that was really problematic. So I guess to me, what isn't co-production? Uh, one example is when there's no meaningful authorship, they're not actually treated as equals. Um, my next example of um, what isn't co-production came from, um, from a tweet that I have a screen grab that I'll share in a moment. But I often hear people um, assume that co-production has to be done through qualitative methods. And I also hear people assume that qualitative methods equal co-production. And both of those claims sit really uncomfortably with me. I'll share this tweet, um, which I, I screen grabbed a couple of years ago. I was on my way to a qualitative health research conference um, when I read this tweet. And so I thought, oh, this is, I, this is really interesting. And I, I kept this screen grab and I, I think about it a lot. This person said, hey, we qualitative researchers have always been doing co-production. 
We have theories and methods and lots of good practices that speak to these new ideas and the challenge they raise. And there's sometimes this assumption from qualitative researchers themselves, and I, I include myself as a qualitative researcher predominantly, um, who assume that because they use methods that listen to the voices of their participants, that that's co-production. But to me, those are, are two very different things. Co-production means that these, um, the group, whoever it is that you are collaborating with, are involved as equal members. They're not just participants in a study um, that you are doing a different method. Um, I guess the other thing I heard recently was people said um, they were doing co-production when really they were just conducting focus groups with people. Um, and that's not to say that focus groups or that qualitative research is bad, but I think it's, what I think is a problem is when we claim we're doing co-production, but all we're doing is involving people as participants, not as collaborators. Um, the last example of what I think we need to be careful about in co-production um, is that because co-production has become quite a buzzword and it's used beyond just the health disciplines and it's used beyond academia, is that sometimes people use it in different ways than we should be using it in health. So this example comes from um, a marketing journal where they talked about um, co-production as when customers of products take part or are engaged, I guess, in part of the processes that would have traditionally been done by businesses. So you can see from this example, they talk about, you know, checking yourself in for a flight or uh, creating IKEA furniture at home as part of co-production. And, and while there's a lot of really important um, information and, and opportunities for collaboration with people in the marketing space and, and from business disciplines, I just think we need to be very careful um, about these kinds of takes to co-production that don't interrogate pow power. I think uh, the issues of power are central to co-production in health, um, given the way that consumers have been vulnerable, marginalised and continue to be um, at the lower end of the hierarchy, if they're in the hierarchy at all. So still look at that literature. There's still a lot of really important literature in the marketing space, but do be careful about how people are using co-production um, to make sure that you are using it in a way that seeks to interrogate power recognizes and celebrates consumers' expertise. And it's not just some new method you're doing, but an approach to collaboration. Okay, many of you, because you're attending this seminar, are probably, probably don't need to be convinced about why co-production is useful. But I thought I'd just mention a couple of examples about why I think it's really useful. Uh, and the first example is that within health disciplines. I don't think anybody has a more holistic understanding of health than consumers. Uh, and I'll show you an example. Uh, for those of you who are not here in Canberra or who don't recognize this building, this is the multi-story car park at the Canberra Hospital. And I'm not, I don't work at the Canberra Hospital, but I do work at the ANU Medical School. So I'm allowed to park in this car park for free uh, undercover, it has 24 seven uh, security uh, and I can always get a park there, go to my meeting and come back and there's no, there's no problem. Consumers, however, uh, often complain about this park, uh, car park. There's no parks free for them. Uh, they've often gotten tickets when they have had um, appointments that have gone over time. Um, so even just when we're talking about designing a car park, consumers have a very different picture and a more relevant picture than, than I have about how we should be designing car parks at a hospital. Now that's just one example, but again, just to talk about how consumers understand the hospital in a very different way to health professionals. Um, you know, everybody, consumers and uh, people who work in health settings, complain about the kinds of food options that are available at hospi hospitals. Uh, but 
health professionals don't understand what it's like to have a very small range of options available in a cafe while waiting for the results of a test or while caring for somebody or while worried that they are about to get a parking fine in the, in the car park. I guess what I'm trying to say is that even, even if we as health professionals move through the same spaces as consumers uh, and we, we experience them in completely different ways. And as health professionals, we don't come from that perspective and we can't necessarily understand what it's like. So my first point about why co-production is useful is that consumers understand things in ways that non-consumers cannot. Uh, even if even if we have very intimate experiences of the same places and the same kinds of scenarios, uh, I guess the um, this is probably summed up most usefully in a paper. Um, I'm self promoting a little bit here, but a paper that we published a couple of years ago called "How Did I Not See That?" and that "How Did I Not See That?" was a quote from somebody who was collaborating with consumers in research, um, and and in fact, most of our participants that we spoke to, um, these were all of the participants we spoke to had collaborated with consumers in research. And again, this was in a mental health um, specific area, but I think the, le the learnings apply across disciplines. Uh, and, and most participants had something to say along these lines that consumers saw things that non-consumers couldn't actually work out how they didn't see it as well because they had they thought that they had a lot of expertise and knowledge about a specific topic but until they actually collaborated with consumers they didn't realize what they couldn't see if that makes sense two more things about why co-production is useful um, the first thing for me uh, is that it saves time a lot of people think that co-production takes takes longer and i think doing these kinds of collaborative processes can be an investment in time, but they certainly save time in the long run. When I think about some of the projects that I've been involved in over the years that um, have turned out to be, you know, going down a dead end or that have turned out to be projects that could just not be completed for whatever, I think if I had co-produced from early on and I had actually, um, you know, meaningfully collaborated with consumers to, um, better understand what was most important and most relevant to them. My, my projects would have been um, honed. I would have been looking at specific issues of, that were important and I wouldn't have come to quite so many dead ends. So it can take a bit of time to set up, but I think it saves you time in the long run. And the other example about why co-production is useful is that I think we're always looking for ways to better our research impact as researchers. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by collaborating with people who understand the kind of impact we need. Uh, I, I always think about um, about a year ago, I think it was, maybe two years ago, COVID has made me forget, you know, the timeline of what happened when. Um, but I wrote a systematic review collaboratively with uh, a consumer. It was a systematic review about palliative care and the consumer that we co-produced that systematic review with was somebody who had cared for his wife um, as she was dying. And that systematic review had huge impact far beyond a lot of my other papers because um, it went to the media, people were interested in our collaborator, our consumer collaborator's story and how that influenced the research. They weren't interested necessarily in the, the academic expertise. They were more interested in what that research meant for somebody who had lived through that experience. That's just one small example, but hopefully it shows why, why, Collaborating with somebody who actually has lived through whatever you're, it is that you're interested in means that there is more potential for impact in that research. Okay, so when can we co-produce? I'd like to say any time, any project you can co-produce. I guess, you know, you've just heard me give an example of even when you're doing a systematic review, you can do that in a co-produced way. Uh, it doesn't have to be... Um, 
a big project, it can be a small project. I have sometimes people people are sort of put off co-production because of what stage of career they're in, but I would say I have a PhD student who is uh, doing wonderful co-production. So she's doing uh, co-production of her of her PhD. She's looking at consumer leadership itself, um, but she has an advisory panel of consumer leaders as well as her um, academic supervisors. And um, they meet quite regularly. So she gets feedback from her supervisor. She gets feedback from her advisory panel who are also, um, are also involved in all of her publications and everything that she does along the way. And it's a wonderful model. And I think it just serves that even in a PhD, you can do co-production. So uh, it doesn't have to be uh, only people in senior positions who have uh, access to lots of funding and access to lots of resources, for example. I also have some fun examples um, where you might not expect co-production. So all of these examples I'm about to show you come from uh, a forthcoming special issue of qualitative research in psychology uh, that I'm co-editing about allyship. Um, so allyship towards any, any kind of consumer movement. And we asked people to consider when they were uh, submitting their manuscripts to us for consideration for publication, we asked them to either co-produce their research or think about why they couldn't co-produce their research. Anyway, we have a, a wonderful forthcoming issue, which will be, I'll enjoy sharing with you all when, it's, when, when I can. But I have four examples here of people who did co-produce their research in this special issue, uh, and they all did it with different groups. So the first one uh, comes from a paper that was conducted uh, in a primary school. And, and you can see this is part of the abstract, um, but they say in this paper, we present an innovative methodology for allyship and research alongside children. The project was inspired by a child and as adult researchers, we embarked on reflexive processes to enable children to design and deliver their own research. Anyway, what I really liked about this paper is that um, this is one of the authors down here, William Davies. Um, so I, I cut out the other authors, but you can see that there were child co-authors on this paper. Uh, and I, I thought that was wonderful. It's not something that we see in research very often. And it, it, it uh, was, a, I guess, a really nice example of where uh, these children who were considered equal partners in this research team were acknowledged. Their expertise was considered equal in terms of authorship as the other authors. So that was just a, a lovely example. Uh, there's a few more examples. So uh, again, from that special issue, uh, there's a paper called From a Stranger to a One of Us Ally, a new Confucian approach to community allyship. Uh, and that again had co-authors who were from the local Chinese community in Townsville here in Australia. Uh, and they that was another example of where community members where their expertise was considered equal to the academic's expertise. Again, from the same issue, there's a, there's a paper called Nothing About Us Without Us, Fat People Speak, uh, and that was uh, all of the authorship team uh, included academics and people who were identified as fat advocates, ad advocates. Uh, and again, was a really nice example of people co-producing and knowledge um, of community members and experiences of community members being valued just like academics expertise. And the last one, reflections on allyship in the context of a co-produced evaluation of a youth integrated therapies mental health intervention, uh, which was uh, yet another mental health uh, example of co-production, uh, which included um, consumers, academics and consumer researchers in that authorship team. So I guess I just wanted to share those to say you could be doing co-production in, in anything that you're doing in a, in a wide range. You know, you could be doing research with children and you could still be engaging in co-production. You could be uh, in your, doing a PhD and still doing co-production. You could be a senior member of a research um, center and setting up infrastructure for co-production. I guess it doesn't matter the context and it doesn't matter where you are in, in your career, you can be doing co-production. So 
So, all of that said, there's four things, I mean, there's more than four things, but there's four things I just want to mention that I think are preventing us from actually achieving co-production. And the first one is funding. Uh, so, I guess in, in academia, we're often striving for funding anyway. Uh, but of course, if we are going to meaningfully co-produce with consumers, then I think we need to make sure that we are we're paying them just as we would any other researcher. Um, and that can be really tricky. And I guess here is where I want to share one of my failures and one of the times I wasn't able to, to, to do this very well. Uh, so this paper, uh, it actually, it's the one that I mentioned a little while ago when I was talking about impact. Consumer and carer leadership in palliative care, academia and practice, a systematic review with narrative synthesis. The second author, Alan Bevan, uh, was, is a consumer researcher and was um, part of our, was, was part of that research team. Uh, but at the time I didn't have access to funding and was not able to, to pay him as a research assistant as I would have liked to. Uh, later on though, I did have access to funding and we were able to, uh, to pay him and, and to pay for him to attend a conference where we, um, where we co-presented co that research. But I guess it still sits kind of uncomfortably that um, this issue of funding. And I guess when we think back to, I think the first slide where I said for co-production to really happen, it needs to occur from the planning phases of, of research. And often uh, when we're doing research, we don't have access to funding in that planning stage. Uh, and so it can be really tricky if we're trying to co-produce research uh, while we're still grappling to even find funding, and if we can't pay collaborators um, as, as we would any other researcher, uh, that can be a real issue. Uh, in my, I'm going to come back to that. I'm just going to leave that hanging there and, and acknowledge that funding is a concern. Uh, and, and hopefully we can talk about some solutions at the end. Another thing that's present, uh, preventing us from the ideal is stigma. Uh, so some of my examples have come, most of my examples, I guess, have come from mental health, uh, where often consumers are not thought to have capacity. Uh, you know, they're often, in terms of mental health, we often think that consumers of mental health services are um, dangerous, scary, you know, all of those very stereotypical stigmatizing attitudes that exist in society uh, influence, influence uh, our ability to co-produce. Um, so that's, that is definitely a big issue. And again, I'm just going to leave it hanging there for a moment and we'll come to solutions later. The third thing that I think is preventing us from uh, ideal co-production is this expectation that people be representative. So I hear this a lot uh, and I hear this, this sort of rhetoric being um, put forward in, in a, a lot of ways. So for example, um, I've found myself sitting in a room often uh, when we're talking about planning for a new research project, for example, uh, and I've said, that's great, let's do this research project and let's make sure we collaborate with consumers and we'll Let's, let's find some consumers who would like to come on board with this project. And, and sometimes people's reply to that will be, yeah, but the kinds of consumers who want to engage with us are professional consumers, uh, or they don't really represent current consumers. And I find this, I find it problematic on a couple of levels. First of all, when, you know, I think about myself as a, as a psychologist, I'm never asked to, to justify if I represent psychologists. And in fact, I'm never, I don't know that that would be possible or useful for me to represent all psychologists anyway. But also the idea, I don't, I just, it's often used to silence consumers' views to say, oh, you know, they're not actually representative. They don't represent uh, most consumers. They don't represent current consumers. So 
it's it's very problematic, um, but it's not uncommon. I come across this all the time when people ask about representation. What I would say, what I think is important is, is that we, you know, when we're talking about collaborating with consumers and particularly if we're looking at consumers in vulnerable or marginalized communities, um, that we do need to try to um, our best to make sure we are engaging with diverse consumers and that we are engaging, um, you know, beyond just white middle-class male consumers, for example. So, so we do need to be concerned about representation, but we shouldn't be concerned about representation in terms of it silencing us. And it puts an unfair uh, requirement on consumers that I don't see with other health professionals. And then the last um, thing that I think is preventing us from the ideal is a lack of flexibility and concerns around timing and pacing of projects. So, um, so in fact, uh, as I say, I'm going to come to solutions soon. So I don't want to talk too much about it, but I guess it's just something that we do need to be aware of that within research ecosystems, there's, kind, there's all kinds of burdens upon us about that, that mean that we're not in flexible working conditions. So for example, we're often working to timelines for grants. We're often um, needing to publish. We're often told that we need to be um, producing outputs. And that, can be a problem if we are also wanting to co-produce meaningfully. All right, I will, I'll move on. Um, but I do next want to talk about just briefly some of my most recent examples in the context of COVID to sort of point out that if we can do co-production even in COVID, uh, then we could probably do it anytime. So earlier this year, uh, I found myself in a position where I was um, coordinating the, the research response to COVID for the Australian Capital Territory when my boss was seconded to uh, lead the COVID task force. And one of the tasks that uh, we worked on was making sure that consumers were part of the production of a triage process that we would use in the ACT if it ever got to the point here uh, where capacity in the ICU was um, exceeded by demand. So essentially, essentially, hopefully it's a triage system we would never use, but we wanted to co-produce it with consumers um, to the extent possible. But of course, earlier on this year, all of our meetings um, were on Zoom and that presented a range of opportunities and challenges for us. So uh, one of the, I guess, one of the benefits of co-producing in the context of COVID is that everything was on Zoom. And one of the particularly marginalised groups that we wanted to co-produce with came from the disability sector. And a lot of our colleagues in the disability sector who we were now meeting on Zoom instead of meeting, you know, at the hospital where they would have to find parking, where they might have issues parking, where they might have issues of accessibility, depending on what building or what room we were in, said, actually, this is wonderful. The fact that we're now meeting on Zoom means that we don't need to be worrying so much about all of those accessibility issues, which are often a concern outside of the context of, of video conferencing. Similarly, a lot of the people we wanted to engage with were carers who said the same kind of thing. They said it was wonderful that they were able to participate in these collaborative processes via video conferencing uh, without needing to leave their loved one, um, which otherwise, if we were having these, you know, co-production seminars or, or workshops in a room, um, either at the university or at the hospital, it could be really difficult. Someone at a seminar I was at last week, um, also from who was from industry, made a really <laughs> um, in, simple but uh, impactful impression on me when they were saying that if we want to do co-production, we really need to think about accessibility uh, for everybody because he says, you know, he works in industry. Whenever he has a meeting at a university, it takes him 
15 minutes to even find a park nearby the building that he needs to park at. Uh, he then needs to find the correct building. Buildings at universities um, are either really poorly numbered or have bizarre names. It's hard to find and then it's hard to find the rooms. And it struck me, I mean, it seems so, so obvious. Um, even as somebody who works in a university, I often find it difficult uh, finding, you know, if I'm in a new building or a new room. Um, but, but essentially, our institutions physically are not set up very well to collaborate with people outside of those institutions. So that was one of the great opportunities that Zoom presented to us. Uh, however, there's also um, some drawbacks, of course. So when we were talking about some of the really awful things that we had to talk about, uh, as is often the case, if we want to collaborate with vulnerable or marginalised communities, uh, there was nowhere for us to debrief with them casually afterwards. We couldn't provide a space to sort of sit down and talk. Um, and we also, one thing I noticed, um, which I'm sure it's not just in terms of co-production, I'm sure we've all noticed this as we've all been video conferencing primarily this year, is that there's nowhere for those uh, I guess impromptu conversations to happen, which in co-production are often the great conversations. You know, somebody after a session might say, oh, have you spoken to this person? You really need to be involving their, their organization or this person in what you're doing. Uh, and it's, and so that is a challenge and that is quite hard. I mean, there's opportunities as well. I mean, the fact that, you know, I can see there are participants joining us here from, um, from all over. So there's, it's certainly, you know, two sides of a coin and there's pros and cons. But I guess, um, you know, even, even just the fact that we were able to think about applying these, these um, principles of co-production in the context of COVID about very different, uh, difficult discussions via video conferencing means I think we can learn and we can do it anywhere. Okay, I'd like to finish by um, just mentioning five steps that I think we can all take um, to move towards better co-production, regardless of where we are at in career or discipline or um, focus of our research. So the first step that I think we can all take right now is to read and cite consumer-led or co-produced work. So make sure that whenever you start a new project, you're seeing if people have already done co-production in that area, or if there has been consumer-led work in that area and cite that work. Make sure that we value people who are doing this important kind of um, collaborative work. My second point, and it almost just seems so obvious that and, and so trite that I, I hesitate to say it, but point two is listen. Uh, just this morning, I saw a news article where the federal government um, was talking about a co-design process with, uh, with Indigenous communities. And, um, and it, was, it was in the media because it, people were complaining to say, actually, this is not co-design. We're not allowing Indigenous people to be heard. Uh, and so I think there are people who are embarking on co-production, but who aren't actually meaningfully engaging and aren't listening to what consumers' needs are or what co-production partners want or need. Uh, so as I say, it almost seems so simple because surely that's, this is a rule that regardless of what research you're doing or regardless of what projects you're engaged in, hopefully you'd be listening. Um, but I think it still needs to be said because uh, people are still not feeling heard even when they are engaging in co-production. My third point of, of what I think we can all be doing right now is build collaboration into your projects and your budgets. So, whenever you start a new project, think about how you might co-produce and, and budget for that. This actually is a screenshot from, um, from a grant um, that I, I put in last year. I, again, I've, I've lost track of, of time with COVID this year. Um, but essentially you can see there, I asked for a research officer uh, and my intention was to uh, 
em employ. I haven't been able to use this funding yet because of COVID, but my intention and, and hopefully next year I will be able to employ a consumer researcher as that research officer for this particular project. Now, um, I think it's, it, this goes back to the point I was talking about earlier around funding. And sometimes it's really hard if we want to make sure that we are from the very beginning of a project, from the planning phases, if we are being co, you know, co-productive, but we don't actually have funding yet to pay consumer researchers, it can be very tricky and I, I sympathise and, and there's broader issues around the academy and funding anyway. Um, so this is why, you know, I say build, build collaboration into your projects and budgets as much as possible and, and keep working on it and improving on it. Now, if you're a, if you are a senior professor in, in charge of a, a large project budget, you know, you can start thinking now about how you will employ consumer researchers. But as I mentioned before, even if you're a, a junior scholar, a PhD student, there's still ways that you can build collaboration into your projects from early on. Uh, and in some ways it goes back to my previous point about listening, which is, you know, listen to the people that you want to collaborate with about how they want to be collaborated with, and that will help you build them into the collaboration efforts. Uh, my fourth step that I think you can all take now is to form alliances with the boss or those who do have power. So uh, a lot of my wins in co-production have been when I've been able to influence people who do have resources, who do have access to funding, who do have, who can make decisions about uh, employing consumer researchers. Um, and and to form alliances with them and show them why co-production in your research program is going to bring them value. And I guess my final point um, that I think we can all do right now is, is to start somewhere and build on um, a co-production strategy. I would say I certainly didn't get it right the first time I tried to do co-production and I'm still learning every single time I engage in a new co-production process. And, and I, I also want to acknowledge, you know, in some of the earlier slides of this seminar, I really heavily criticised some people who said they were doing co-production but weren't. Um, but I want to also acknowledge the fact that we can all learn and we can learn about how we might improve our co-production processes. And, and, and in fact, we should be learning how we improve them. Um, you won't get it right the first time and you, there's always something that you can learn by listening to consumers that you want to collaborate with and and building and each time uh, getting better at that and not being afraid of, of building. So I might leave it there and um, move to questions, but um, thank you everybody. And uh, Kristen, I might hand back to you to handle some of the questions. Thank you so much, Brett. That was wonderful. Thank you uh, for all of your insights and your reflections. It's nice to see um, someone being so thoughtful about that because it's, it's a challenge, but I think it's really important for us to be um, thinking about and doing more around, so thank you. Um, we do have one question that's already come in. So of course, people, if you have questions, um, feel free to pop them in the Q&A box and we can then go to you live. You can also raise your hand um, and I can see that we have someone um, who has raised their hand already and we have a question that's come in through our Q&A box. So we might start with the Q&A box and then we'll go to Marley who has their hand up. So we'll start with Vicky, um, not. We can unmute you, Vicky, um, to ask your question. If that's not possible, we can read it out. Oh, here we go, Vicky's on now. Okay, hi, uh, it's wonderful to be able to listen to Brett. Fantastic presentation, thank you, it's so interesting. What I'm interested about is wondering whether um, you've experienced any barriers when dealing with ethics committees. So, for example, do they kind of not get this notion of co-production? And also, do they then perhaps come back and say, oh, you know, you're dealing with a very vulnerable population here, um, therefore, you know, this study is particularly risky. Just wondering if you've had any experiences in that way. Yeah, thank you, Vicky, and lovely to see you virtually. Uh, I, I have, 
I have certainly had issues with this. Um, I think it's gotten better. And I guess in some ways we're a little bit privileged here at the ANU in that uh, our ethics committee is chaired by somebody with lived experience um, who I, I believe identifies as a consumer researcher. So in some ways we are lucky. Uh, but there certainly have been um, comments that have come back from ethics committees asking us to justify um, why we would use, uh, I guess, consumers and, and sort of implying that, um, implying that it wasn't a co-production, that it was a partnership. And, um, and so it is, a, it's, it's, it's tricky. I don't necessarily have an answer for how we get around that issue other than uh, keep trying. What, in fact, I'm, I'm reminded of, and sorry, this is I'm, I'm slight tangent, but it's really important. The PhD student I mentioned earlier, who is, is working on a co-produced PhD with an advisory panel of consumers, had real struggles with her ethics committee about, um, about assuming that there was a lack of capacity of these people who had gone through you know, mental ill health. And it struck me as so paternalistic and part of that problem about how we don't value um, consumer knowledge. So I guess, you know, my, my answer is that we just need to keep trying. Maybe the more that we value uh, co-produced research and the more that we push for it to be normalized, that people will understand that these paternalistic views can be really problematic. Uh, but it, I acknowledge it's a struggle and it's it's not easy. Thanks, Brett. And I think I think like you say, I think it's about education and uh, just just keep pushing forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Um, we've had a question come through on our chat from Polly, and we've also got an anonymous question in the Q and A. So what I might do is give Michaela time to unmute Polly if that's possible, and I'll ask you the anonymous question first, and then we'll go to Polly. Um, so the anonymous um, attendee question is: Do you see many initiatives in Australia at the federal, state, or community levels to fund more co-produced research? And in general, do you see any moves in this direction in mental health research specifically in terms of calling for specific research in this area? Yes and no. So the NHMRC does now have a consumer panel. So, um, so the NHMRC is interested in co-produced research, at least from their end, they're demonstrating it by uh, employing consumers as part of the, their panels, which is great to see. Um, whether that's translating to, to funding co-produced research, I think is yet to be seen, uh, but I think people are starting to take it seriously. I guess the other thing I'd mention in relation to that question is that, you know, you can look to the UK where it has been required that consumers or patient and public involvement, as, as they'd call it in the UK, is part of every grant that goes in within the country, which still does lead to tokenistic research. And it still does lead to checkboxing of saying of people saying, yeah, we've collaborated with a consumer, but that consumer hasn't necessarily been part of the team as an equal member. So even where there are initiatives to fund um, that they, it can still happen tokenistically. So I see, I see it moving slowly, um, but there's still some promising things on the horizon, such as the NHMRC's panel. Awesome. Thank you, Brett. Um, we have a live question with Polly, if Polly's able to unmute, and then we'll go to Lillian after that. Hi, Brett. Thanks for that great talk and for all the resources. And I'm really excited to look, seek out that book and all the different papers. I'm interested in co-produce research, but I'm also very interested in open science. And I was just wondering, I mean, I don't really have much experience in co-produced research. And I'm just wondering, how would you, you know, um, try and build that at the beginning to get your um, consumers sort of on board with, the, you know, doing open science research? You know, it's the how-to really. Yeah, so first steps of engaging are often the hardest, I would say. Um, I guess just from my, my experience, and I'm not necessarily saying that this is the best way, but it's, it's sort of the way that I have done it. Um, say, for example, that, that uh, systematic review I was talking about earlier in palliative care, 
I actually, I searched for a number of people who might be interested um, in collaboratively producing that from a consumer perspective. Uh, and, and there were people that I met with and spoke to who, um, who I thought might be interested, but weren't, and that's fine. Um, and then eventually I think um, a colleague put me through to Alan who we ended up having a conversation and, and he seemed interested. And, and I guess that was how it first happened. So um, lots of conversations that didn't end up being partnerships um, and then stumbling upon somebody who, whose values were aligned and who did want to be involved and did want to co-produce. Um, and it sort of, it went from there. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily answering your question other than to say, I guess it's, there can be a bit of trial and error and it can be a bit of a process to, to find people who do want to partner with you. Okay, thanks so much. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Um, we'll go to Lillian's question. If, if, yep, beautiful. Hi, Brett. Thanks for that. That was a really interesting talk. So I guess I have a, a, a real question related to Polly's question about the practical processes of collaborating with consumers. So what tasks are and are not appropriate to assign to a consumer team member and how we sort of balance valuing their voice and their approach with meeting standards for academic rigor. So I imagine if we want to include them, say, at the analysis stage, which, you know, we'd like to include them at all stages, that might require us training them in analysis approaches. And I wonder if that training kind of dilutes their perspective in some way. So I guess if you have any sort of practical advice on how to include a consumer researcher. Yeah, no, thank you, Lillian. Uh, I guess, I guess in terms of, uh, is there anything that's not appropriate to ask of them? I think, I think it goes back to the, my point about listening and finding out how people want to be engaged and how they want to be involved. I, I remember this conversation, a conversation I had with a, a very good friend who I respect a lot. Um, about co-production and and he sort of made the comment saying oh you know but um the consumers you you might be co-producing with probably haven't read Foucault in as much detail as you and might not be able to analyze in the same way that you do you do and i kind of thought i felt like a bit of a failure there because i haven't read Foucault since um undergrad um but also and i mean that his point was not about Foucault specifically his point was that i guess you know as academics we have um a lot of experience and, and application of theory um, and, and production of knowledge. Um, but I would say, I would say that a lot of the kinds of analyses that I'm involved in are actually enriched by consumer perspectives as well. So say, for example, if I was going to do a discursive analysis of something, um, I would say that that's actually enriched by engaging with um, consumers rather than than otherwise. And I guess, I guess one important point that I do want to make about that is, you know, there's also, of course, non-qualitative approaches and, and quantitative analyses, which do require specific kind of analytical skills. But I think consumers um, and, and, you know, community collaborators can be really meaningfully involved in any interpretation of analysis. Um, because, because when we're interpreting our analysis, we're either uh, applying theory or or knowledge and that experiential knowledge can be just as important a part of the analytic process and the interpretation of the analysis as academic knowledge if that answers your question yeah i think it does thanks thank you thank you lillian um, we have one more and i think that's going to take us to about time so i'll i'll read this one out to an anonymous attendee with a i think great question that you can use to wrap up <laughs> the talk. Um, so the question is, what have consumers said to you about their experience in co-producing research with you and any insights or challenges that they have encountered? Yeah, I, I would, this is a perfect a point where I'd love to have, um, have some, some of my consumer colleagues here to, to answer that question uh, so that it's not sort of funneled through my interpretation. Um, I guess, um, you know, it, it's very broad and it changes for every project. I might just mention, go back to Alan again, who um, co-produced the systematic review and palliative care with me, uh, who I think, you know, for him, as I, as I mentioned before, his experiences of palliative care through caring for his, um, his wife, his, his wife who had, who had died, uh, I think for him it was, 
you know, he did reflect on what it was, what it meant to be able to sort of, I guess, give back and what it meant to be able to be involved and use those experiences to produce something um, as being, as being a, a positive experience. Uh, and I guess in relation to that last bit of the question about insights on challenges that they have encountered, um, I none. I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't challenges. I'm sure there are. Um, and this does make me wish that I'd, I'd asked and I'd listened and, and you've inspired me to, to ask that question. I guess, I guess just very broadly, some of the challenges that we've spoken about in broad senses are things like um, the way that institutions still don't value lived experience in the way that they value academic experience. And, and just a, one very practical thing, I know I'm over time, so one very practical thing is that, um, for example, when we submit manuscripts to journals for consideration for publication, you know, it asks you to put in your institution and your qualifications and where you got your PhD and all of those kinds of things that are very much situated to to, to show why academic knowledge is privileged over, over consumers' knowledge. So there's a lot of these little institutional things that we take for granted um, that are a challenge. And, and there's more, but I might, I might leave it there noting I'm already over time, I apologize. Yeah, that's completely fine, Brett. <laughs> um, I wanted to say thank you. I think we could keep this conversation going. <laughs> for a lot longer today um, and maybe we'll have to get you back to, <laughs> to talk more about this. Um, I think it's been a wonderful um, seminar and thank you to you but also to everybody for engaging in it and the questions you've asked. I think this is an area we can really think deeply about um, and, and think about the way we're doing, what we're doing and why. Um, so I wanted to say thank you very much um, to Brett and to everybody for your attendance and for participating. Um, as always, we're back next week. We have a, another Gibbs seminar from our social personality theme. Um, and it is um, Dr. Katie Greenaway from the University of Melbourne on the psychology of secrecy. So I think that's gonna be a fascinating topic as well. Um, so I will uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, especially to Brett um, for taking time out today um, and wish you all the very best for your lunch and for the rest of the week. Um, we hope to see you all next week. So thank you all. Thank you.